Hi, everyone. This is Z. David Crawford, Editor-in-Chief of Grand Rounds in Urology. Predicated on encouraging results of neoadjuvant therapies in a number of different cancers, neoadjuvant trials before radical prostatectomy were commenced over three decades ago using primarily monotherapy with LHRH agonists. Dr. Fernand Labrie from Quebec, Canada, Mark Soloway from the U.S., Marty Glee from Canada conducted non-conclusive trials in this arena. As a matter of fact, in SWOG, Eric Klein from the Cleveland Clinic started a study which we terminated early for lack of accrual. The introduction of new agents such as androgen biosynthesis inhibitors and third generation anti-androgens has fostered a new interest in this new adjuvant therapy. Joining us to update findings in the Proteus clinical trial is my colleague at UC San Diego, Dr. Raina McKay. She is a professor of medicine, co-leader of the GU Onc team at the Morris Cancer Center. Raina did her residency at Johns Hopkins and fellowship at the Dana-Farber Harvard Medical School and later became an assistant professor before moving to UCSD. Raina, thanks for contributing to our education in Grand Rounds in Urology. Well, thank you so much for having me uh, here today, uh, Dr. Crawford, and I'm ex excited to present um, the results of a phase two trial of intense androgen deprivation therapy prior to radical prostatectomy in men with high-risk disease. This trial is um, culminated from the work of, of many collaborators spearheaded by Dr. Taplin at the Dana-Farber and has really provided the rationale for um, the Proteus trial, which is currently enrolling. So um, as we know, uh, patients with prostate cancer, uh, the, the, it's the most common cancer of men in the United States. The majority of patients present with localized disease. And of those with localized disease, approximately 15% um, have high-risk features based on PSA, Gleason score, or stage and have a 15-year prostate cancer-specific mortality of upwards to 38% based on um, certain risk stratifications. And so, you know, when we think about the paradigm um, for patients with high-risk prostate cancer, it really hasn't changed over the last several decades. And this has classically included radical prostatectomy followed by adjuvant and now so or more so early salvage radiation therapy with ADT or upfront definitive radiation therapy with ADT. And neoadjuvant therapy prior to radical prostatectomy is still under investigation. This approach is the standard of care in breast, rectal, bladder, and other cancers, and such treatment has improved long-term survival. Um, the treatment results in local disease downstaging, may facilitate surgical resection, may reduce and delay post-surgery treatment, and provides an in vivo assessment of response to therapy. And as you were saying, Dr. Crawford, you know, there's been a, a flurry of uh, historic neoadjuvant trials that were conducted in the 1990s that primarily used LHRH agonists uh, with or without first-generation anti-androgens. The majority of these trials enrolled, enrolled low-risk patients. They did not systematically evaluate the pathologic response, and long-term follow-up was limited. However, um, there's been a series of contemporary new adjuvant trials that have investigated more potent androgen-targeting agents such as abiraterone, enzalutamide, apalutamide. These trials have been conducted in patients with high-risk disease as opposed to those with low risk. They've integrated systemic central pathology review to evaluate response, and they've also integrated long-term follow-up. So here is a summary slide of a series of neoadjuvant trials that um, we've conducted sequentially that have built our understanding of disease biology. While in castration-resistant prostate cancer, combination abiraterone and enzalutamide, enzalutamide have not proven beneficial, we evaluated this approach in hormone-sensitive disease. And acknowledging the limitations of these phase two studies, we demonstrate a signal that pathologic responses are observed with potent hormonal therapy. And we can see here the pathologic complete response and minimal residual disease, which is less than, um, you know, uh, uh, five uh, uh, centimeters of tumor in the remaining radical prostatectomy specimen can be upwards of, you know, 30 percent um, with uh, these combination therapies. So this brings us to the current um, trial that we'll discuss today. This is the trial schema. 
this trial enrolled um, men with uh, prostate adenocarcinoma who had either 4 plus 3 um, prostate cancer or PSA of greater than 20 or T3 disease as determined by MRI. Pelvic limb nodes had to be less than uh, 20 um, uh, uh, centimeters or 20 uh, millimeters, and they had to have a good performance status. Um, this was a two-part trial. In part one, patients were randomized to therapy with abiraterone, prednisone, apalutamide, or luprolide for six months, or abiraterone, prednisone, and luprolide for six months, followed by radical prostatectomy. And here we'll pre present the results of part one of the study. Um, part two um, will uh, randomize patients to an additional year of combination therapy versus observation, and that part is uh, currently ongoing. The primary endpoint for part one is the rate of past CR and minimal residual disease by central pathology review. So the uh, key take-home message from the trial is that um, the pathologic complete responses were observed in 13% of patients who received uh, quad therapy with abiraterone, prednisone, apalutamide, and luprolide, and 10% with abiraterone, prednisone, and luprolide. But when we look at the combined past CR minimal residual disease rate, it really is about equivalent between the two arms at 20 per 22% and 20%. Pelvic no uh, Positive pelvic nodal disease was seen in 7% of patients with APAL and 12% of patients with APL. And there was heterogeneity in the percent of uh, cellularity in the residual tumor specimens and median cellularity was 5% in each arm. When we look at um, toxicity, um, there's really no new safety signal that's observed from therapy. 13% of 13 patients experienced grade 3 treatment-related adverse events. There were no grade four or five treatment-related adverse events. 24 patients required an abiraterone dose modification and 17 patients required an apalutamide dose modification. So in summary, um, intense neuroadjuvant hormone therapy appears to benefit a subset of patients with high-risk disease. We do not observe that the combination of abiraterone with apalutamide and luprolide um, did not have improved pathologic responses compared to abiraterone and luprolide alone. And so this brings us to um, the currently um, enrolling Proteus trial, um, and our data that was presented from this trial really support the design of the current study, which is a phase three randomized double-blinded um, uh, placebo-controlled trial investigating perioperative apalutamide in patients with high-risk localized or locally advanced prostate cancer who are candidates for RP. Patients who have high-risk features even higher than what we would designate by NCCN guidelines, as, as you can see here on this slide, they're randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive apalutamide and, and ADT versus placebo and ADT. They undergo six months of therapy and then go on to have a radical prostatectomy and then receive an additional six months of adjuvant therapy after surgery. And the receipt of adjuvant or salvage radiation therapy is really at the discretion of the treating investigator. It is allowed in the context of the trial. The trial has a co-primary endpoint of both pathologic complete response and also metastasis-free survival. And this really is a landmark study because it will define pathologic responses to neoadjuvant therapy, validate pathologic response as a surrogate for metastasis-free survival, and investigate biomarkers of treatment response and resistance. So just to highlight a little bit of the things that we're excited about, um, with regard to correlative work that's being done in the context of these trials, it's really trying to identify um, intermediate pathologic endpoints in prostate cancer. Can a pathologic response correlate with improved long-term survival? We haven't proven that yet in prostate cancer, so, so early data from meta-analyses from our prior neoadjuvant studies would suggest that. The integration of imaging and tissue biomarkers to guide therapy selection. We didn't review this here, but we had conducted a paired multi-parametric prostate MRs um, in the context of this trial and a subset of patients that were enrolled at the Dana-Farber. 71 patients underwent paired MRIs both at baseline and prior to radical prostatectomy, and analyzing that data and integrating with the pathology data um, is going to be interesting to help guide therapy selection. Also defining the exceptional responders. You know, who are the people that actually are the patients that have a path CR, minimal residual disease, and it's almost heresy to say it, but <laughs> are there patients who may not require radical prostatectomy? We're certainly not there yet, but, um, you know, I think, you know, this, this model is sort of evolving in rectal cancer and and can we think about that being an aspiration in the future for, for prostate cancer? And then I think the other big thing is that while, you know, 20% of patients have dramatic responses, you know, who are the non-responders and how can we escalate therapy for the non-responders? Are these patients better served with chemotherapy? What adjuvant therapy can we 
plan post-prostatectomy in those people who have limited responses. And, you know, this trial design, the new adjuvant trial design, really presents an opportunity and a platform for biomarker-driven adjuvant studies. So thank you. And um, lots of uh, individuals have been involved in the, in the running of these series of kind of phase, small phase two trials, but they've really helped steer the field and lead to a large phase three that will hopefully change the landscape for advanced RCT or advanced prostate cancer. Raina, thank you very much. That was a very informative uh, update. And so how's the accrual going on that trial? So the trial that I presented is, is has completed accrual. Um, the Proteus trial is currently enrolling patients and um, I believe accrual will be completed um, sometime next year. It's actually been accruing pretty robustly. It's an international trial um, enrolling a total sample size of, of 1,500 patients. So we don't yet have any data from Proteus to share, um, and I think it's going to be some time to get a readout on the pathologic endpoints um, and really the um, metastasis-free survival. So, um, but I think it's it's a trial that, if positive, will change the way we think about prostate cancer and will change the paradigm for localized disease. Congratulated for uh, doing this. Uh, as you well know, there are a plethora of trials with uh, neoadjuvant hormones and adjuvant hormones with radiation dating way back to the mid-'80s, and uh, most of them showed some sort of benefit for combination therapy. And I've always believed that uh, if it works with radiation, it should work with surgery. And uh, and it's it's great that you're doing a trial that's adequately powered with a lot of intermediate endpoints and markers and things like that that will help us uh, uh, know an answer. Just uh, one more quick question is uh, what what sort of markers are used? I mean, we're familiar with uh, this cipher. Is that part of it? And what uh, what are the other markers you're using? So the cipher is not integrated into the trial um, into this trial, but I think from um, work that's been done by Ellie Van Allen. Um, you know, we uh, presented data on uh, looking at the baseline biopsies from the exceptional responders and the exceptional non-responders. And was there something in those baseline biopsies that could predict that um, somebody would be, you know, negative responder or a positive responder? And via, you know, um, uh, robust sequencing of multiple foci within the baseline prostate biopsies and you know we're we're you know it's sort of you're limited by your the availability of your tissue because these are like baseline prostate biopsies there's really not a whole lot of tissue there but it actually seemed that SPOP alterations seem to be enriched in responders and mutually exclusive in that we did not see them in non-responders whereas P10 ERG RB seem to be seen in the exceptional non-responders. And whether that could be utilized as a biomarker, I think it's still too early. I think we're still trying to understand that, but I think the genomics of the disease can potentially help guide therapy selection and, you know, potentially thinking about the genomics of the residual tumors in the radical prostatectomy specimens that are removed could help guide therapy selection. You know, you know, are these patients that are more hormone resistant, do they benefit better from docetaxel, for example, or other yeah. chemotherapy agents? Right. Well, listen, uh, Marina, thank you very much for your discussions. Uh, stay tuned, and uh, we'll have some more discussion uh, in the next session here in a minute if uh, anybody wants to uh, listen to it. <laughs>